Hello, everyone. Uh, so welcome to our next uh, CRWDP webinar. We have Alola Day here. Uh, Alola Hello, Day. everyone. Hi, everyone. This is Alola Day. Uh, Alola Day is going to be talking to us today about the employment experiences of persons with disabilities around St. John's, uh, including their conditions and implications. So uh, without further ado, um, I will turn it over to Alola Day. Um, just so everyone knows beforehand, uh, we will have a key. Uh, welcome to this webinar presented by me, um, Olala Day. So my topic is um, employment conditions and implications, the experiences of persons with disabilities around St. John's in Newfoundland. Um, okay. So the purpose of the study initially is focused on investigating, you know, the employment experiences of persons with disabilities, varying degrees of disabilities, mental, physical in urban and suburban Newfoundland, you know, how their location affects their access to obtaining social support systems, getting job opportunities, you know, health care, and the various barriers they had experienced in the past or still experience, and also, you know, opportunities for career advancement if they've had any. You know, generally how their work and life conditions can be improved to help, you know, foster their recruitment productivity, retention and career advancement in the workforce. So this research, you know, aims to look into um, those areas. And the aim of the study, you know, of course, it's um, aimed to contribute positively to the workplace disability uh, policy field, you know, by just improving general awareness about the experiences of persons with disabilities, their work and life experiences, and in the long run to propose useful specific, feasible, and financially affordable policy solutions, inclusion policies, you know, for the future, and, you know, which could help foster their recruitment and, you know, into the labor force of persons with disabilities. And I'll go a little into the background of the study. I know a lot of us are into the disability field, right? So, you know, the background of the study, a study conducted, you know, by Turco 2014, on the labor market participation of you know from persons with um, disabilities, it um, stated that in you know right from like you know the past in 2011, the employment rate of Canadians aged like 25 to 64 with disabilities was about 49 percent, compared with 79 percent for Canadians without a disability, and also um, the employment rate amongst persons with disabilities aged 25 to 64 with a mild disability was 68%, and that was compared to 54% of those with a moderate disability. So this kind of um, goes to show that the more severe the disability, it kind of limits the chances of getting employment for persons with disabilities. 42% also employment rate was recorded then for persons with a severe disability, as opposed to 26% amongst those with a very severe disability. And, um, you know, regarding education as well, the difference in employment rates of persons with disabilities and those without a disability, it was lower among university graduates. So, but this difference was also non-significant in the case of university graduates who had a mild or moderate disability. And well, fast forward to 2017, persons with very, according to Statistics Canada, 2017, so it says um, persons with very severe disabilities, they are two and a half times less likely to be employed than those with mild disabilities. So the, the study also, you know, aimed to look into that area, how accommodations can be better customized, you know, to accommodate people with more severe disabilities, how employers can provide them with different supports to make them more, you know, to foster their, you know, recruitment and make them more productive in the workforce. And um, I'll go now, so the problem statements, of course, it states, you know, it shows that even till today, past and recent studies have shown that persons with disabilities are still underrepresented in the workforce today. And, you know, even if they are employed, from the research I conducted as well, you know, first and experiences, they still face massive ob obstacles in terms of their working conditions, economics, accommodations, even career advancement opportunities. And this is very true for those with more severe disabilities or maybe low educational attainment. And um, this study also revealed that a lot of persons with disabilities, 
They need, you know, work and educational accommodation and support. Some are in place, of course, but not as functional as they should be. Or even some stated that they, were, they didn't even get any accommodations at all. And, um, you know, well over the years, as according to Prince 2016, you know, they said, um, well over the years, the government has developed measures to enable Canadians with disabilities to participate in the labor force. We know the government has been proactive in providing, you know, a lot of support. But he, Prince 2016 found that efforts have still been inconsistent because federal, provincial, you know, local programs for Canadians with disabilities have been described as a disjointed patchwork of widely varying practices and uneven accessibility, affordability, and responsiveness. So it's kind of what we also found out is a lot of employers, even though they want to accommodate, they still try to save costs, though they should you know, accommodate up to the point of undue hardship. But even from this study, I found that those who work with some private firms, they, you know, they kind of limit the accommodation facilities they, they provide to persons with disabilities, just because they try to save costs. And, um, and all, even if some of these facilities are in place, how functional are they? And I'll go straight into the, my research questions. So my research questions looked into what should be the role of the Canadian government and employers in general in promoting the formal welfare and access to social support you know, for persons with disabilities, particularly those in the suburban areas, rural, um, inaccessible areas, because they face more challenges. And a place like Newfoundland, you know, it's kind of, um, though it's um, kind of, a, you know, it's not a, as big, it's not a big province, but still people find it difficult to transport themselves from mostly the suburban areas to come to St. John's. St. John's is, a, you know, the capital where they can access, you know, healthcare facilities, um, get, you know, job opportunities or get other social support to foster their recruitment in the, you know, into the labor force. And that's a key problem a lot of participants identified. And the another research question, you know, I looked into was to what extent does the type and severity of a disability prevent or delay labor force participation? How can, you know, different accommodations be more customized and to support varying degrees of disabilities, especially those with more severe disabilities. And even what programs and policies would, if made available, prolong labor force participation of persons with disabilities, foster retention, improve overall productivity, of course, because if, you know, amongst persons with disabilities. And to what extent also do employers promote the health and productivity of workers with disabilities in terms of professional skill development, you know, regular salary increases, um, career advancement, and different employee assistance programs, maybe which to example like work site wellness programs. You know, it's been proven from previous research like Catherine et al. in 2009. You know, work site wellness programs can definitely improve, help to improve the health and welfare of persons with disabilities in, you know, in the labor force. And um, the, I'll go straight to the results. So, you know, results indicated, first of all, the, um, I collected the data, like I said, from 12 participants. And, you know, they were of working ages, ranging from 18 to 65, living around St. John's, Newfoundland. And, um, you know, it's, um, the research aimed to look into, to gather meaningful, adequate, and accurate first-hand information about their employment experiences. And various things, you know, were investigated regarding their employment experiences relating to, you know, duration of their past employment, um, accommodation facilities they had received or had not received in the workforce, or any perceived discrimination, uh, you know, in such as maybe stigma or exclusion, you know, generally the experiences in terms of barriers to their labor force participation. And the findings from the study, you know, it's revealed common themes amongst the participants. Firstly, you know, the issue of, um, you know, mobility, that's a key problem, and relocation. Disclosure was also one major theme, stigma, accommodations. You know, a number of participants, like I said, they, they identified the issue of slow, um, accessible transportation, even if they're trying to get to work early. So, uh, you know, a particular um, participant I recall, stated it takes about 45 minutes for him to, you know, for even the um, 
the, uh, the tra accessible transportation to come, take him to work. And he said it's also expensive for him. So, and then most of the participants regarding disclosure, they stated that they would rather not disclose their status for employment purposes, you know, because um, I feel a lot of them, because the stigma they said, you know, associated with the condition, which shouldn't be, they said, of course, if they know it will be significant, um, significant enough to impact their obtaining gainful employment due to past experiences. Like for a particular, you know, participant, not even like out of the 12 people interviewed, only one person stated she was going to disclose her disability. She has a, you know, a physical disability and she only stated that because she's entitled to different benefits from the government when she's finding work, she, she prefers to disclose. But the, uh, the other participants stated that because, um, you know, due to past experiences and what they have seen happen to other people, they, um, you know, when they started disclosing while, you know, applying for work, they, they stopped getting interviews as they used to. A lot of them identify that they would rather disclose on maybe if they get the interview, of course, they might or might not still disclose to the employers that they would need some this type of accommodations. And um, I would also say, you know, because um, they um, for some of the participants as well, this um, perceived stigma and discrimination associated with their conditions has led to their decision of being, you know, unwilling or to disclose their disability status when applying for jobs. And um, so I would say that, um, so meanings were formed. So I looked into all these recurring themes on disclosure, mobility, accommodations, and meanings were formed based on similar responses of interviewees. And um, of course, from previous literature reviewed on the topic. And um, so I would say also, like for example, the participants stated it was you know really unfortunate because she had worked a couple of jobs in the past while in school but you know she spoke to an advisor after her graduation about um you know when applying for jobs if she could you know disclose her disability and um and the advisor of course advised that it's better to disclose so that you know the employer can make proper accommodations but she said ever since she started disclosing you know she had not gotten any interviews in almost a year and she had gotten about three to four even before she started to disclose. And this was recurring in you know, most of the other participants because a number of the other participants also they identified similar experiences, you know, regarding disclosure. So relocation, you know, a lot of participants in St. John's Newfoundland Labrador, they they say and the suburbs, so though, you know, like a lot of them they got employment through free employment programs, persons with disabilities. So like two participants identified that they got the employment, you know, from their current jobs from free employment programs, which are very useful, and um, and they've been there. But what they're saying is um, they said, like one of the participants stated, he, it's, he finds it difficult to get career advancement opportunities still, and they feel they can get better, you know, job opportunities if they move to other regions. But due to the fact that they have family ties, I would say all, all the participants I interviewed mentioned family ties, which goes to show that it's very important as well. You know, it goes a long way in, you know, psychologically, if they have family support from friends or people close to them. So they said it's, they have considered to relocate from the region at the time, but due to family ties they have in the region, it would be difficult to relocate because they get, of course, a lot of support from family, you know, and it would be difficult for them to leave the region. And um, so, and then, okay, I will go now into, so I will describe more the participants and how I categorize the concepts. So regarding, um, it, um, so the, the 12 participants I interviewed, the data related to the nature of their disabilities, education and work and life experiences was collected. And also, uh, like I said, disclosure, data related to disclosure of the nature of their disability was collected. Also, data related to decisions whether they want to stay in the St. John's Newfoundland Labrador region or to leave to get more employment opportunities was also collected. And these categories of data, you know, led to, you know, the construction of a better understanding of their similar experiences. 
well, where a lot of the participants, the persons with disabilities, they feel it was deduced that they feel that why they might have, you know, even adequate education and experience, they are most, they are usually they feel a kind of setback to disclose their disability when looking for jobs. So they feel like for the fear of not getting any opportunity. And this is particularly true, as I inferred, um, deduced from the study, for persons with invisible disabilities, because they feel like this could limit their chances to you know, obtain the job. And furthermore, they feel that even if they obtain the job, they do not feel free you know, to disclose the you know, nature or extent of the limitations they experience, meaning that most employees you know, with disabilities may continue to work without their need being addressed because of, you know, you know, so maybe some kind of fear related to potential consequences uh, related to their disclosure. And this could definitely affect the, their productivity on the job. And um, the findings from each participant were compared to those of the other participants to understand commonalities and differences. And the findings were analyzed by comparing these participants' responses to determine, you know, why is it that these commonalities exist between them. Moving on, I would say I will go into I'll go into more discussion regarding my results. So like I said, all the participants they have they had some work experience in the past. Two so were currently unemployed and they were still searching for work. And um for the twelve participants they had a bachelor's degree. Two so were still in their undergraduate programs as at the time of the interview and we are working part time. Two, you know, two had a master's degree and they were working full time. Two were also in the process of completing their master's degree and we were working part time. Two had high school diplomas, and six of the participants reported having invisible disabilities, five of which were learning disabilities. And while the other particip uh, participants had disabilities which were physical in nature, and um, one of them, I, um, one of the participants I interviewed, she she had an injury, you know, um, an injury, or oh, you know, a workplace injury, and she stated outright she was fired from the job. Yes, and that was really shocking. She was fired on the job because, of course, she got injured on that job, but her productivity reduced. So and I, and I was like, <laughs> that is so so rather unfortunate. And uh, she said um, it was a private firm, you know, kind of, um, they had branches, but it was a private firm. She, she got a job, you know, right after. And on that job, she had told the employer as well, the current paper she was using was kind of irritating her arm. So she needed more accommodation. Could they change the paper? And then um, the employer told her, well, they were gonna do something about it. Of course, she said it took a lot of, it took some time, a lot of paperwork, documentation, and when the employer finally provided another paper, it was even cheaper than the one she was working with, you know, and that continued to irritate her arm. So she said she experienced a, a very, very bad time in the other company she even got a job with. And she said nothing was done to accommodate her further. And I was saying, oh, that is really unfortunate. And you know, these varying degrees of disabilities, they aided in developing a general understanding of their work and life experiences, how these disabilities affect them. Another participant, she, you know, she identified with a physical disability. She had faced a lot of discrimination while trying to get jobs. And of course, one time she had gotten an interview and when she got there, the building was not accessible. And this was, um, you know, sometime around 2015. And she said when she got there, and um, they had to tell her to come up the stairs with her wheelchair. And she told them, okay, because she's in a wheelchair, and then she would need an elevator, of course. Mm -hmm. It took a lot of hassle. When she got there, she could already she could feel the awkwardness. So I guess the employers were unaware she had a physical disability. And you know, she said when she got into the interview room she could feel the awkwardness outright from, you know, and that was so uncomfortable. That was really uncomfortable for her because of course she said, everyone feels nervous. If, even you don't have a disability, you feel nervous when you're going for interviews and that shouldn't be an extra headache for people with disabilities. And then, so she said, of course, that was just one of some experiences and other participants also, they, they, 
you know, identified similar experiences. So, and then another um, participant had stated that, you know, she, um, you know, she, she started disclosing her disability as well while trying to get work. And, also, of course, she hadn't gotten any interviews in a long time. One, you know, out of the 12, two stated they haven't experienced any discrimination while, you know, working, even finding work. Their employers, they said, were very accommodative of their disabilities and even provided enough support for them. But the remaining 10 said they had faced a lot of discrimination. And um, so I will go and um, so I said, what, what I'm saying now is disclosure should be made stigma-free and um, employers need to start um, going the extra length to accommodate persons with disabilities. Because of course, it's very evident that most persons with disabilities, they feel reluctant to disclose their status now when applying for jobs, as they feel they'll be discriminated against. And of, although there's a you know, robust amount of legislation which has been designed in the past until now to prevent this, but there's still, you know, you know, according to recent research, persons with disabilities are still underemployed as compared to those without disabilities. And as um and they feel that um, you know, even most persons with disabilities who are employed, they feel they are not properly accommodated and that employers can do better. And um, disclosure of a disability should not be perceived to be a factor which can prevent the participation of persons with disabilities in the labor force. And employers have to seek to recruit more persons with disabilities. The implications of non-disclosure, I would say, you know, because the findings from the interviews have indicated that pieces, uh, persons with disabilities, they, 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 you know, they feel reluctant to disclose their disabilities when applying for work. And most of the participants, they stated they have been told in the past, it's up to them, maybe through advisors or employment agencies or disability resource centers, that it is completely up to them to, you know, disclose their disability. But they told, you know, from they said they would rather not for fear, apart from the one person who said she would disclose because she's entitled, you know, once she, once she discloses while she's applying for work, she's entitled to, she, she, she can get an, a lot of benefits from the government. And, um, but, you know, she, and that's an advantage to her. So she doesn't feel discouraged, she said, as she believes she shouldn't be judged based on her disability, of course, and it should be based on her intellect. And on the other hand, employers who are also unable to make appropriate employment or accommodation decisions, maybe due to some financial constraints, and they, they, you know, they have to go the extra length, except if it's up to the point of undue hardship. And um, so, I will go into um, any, I don't, any questions so far, right? Keep going. Okay, so I'll go into my recommendations for now. And uh, okay, before I go into the recommendations, I'll go more into you know some of the participants' responses. And um, so, like um, I, one of the persons I spoke to now, I, I think he identifies with an invisible disability, but he runs and he's doing very well for himself. He runs a disability resource center, also in the capital region. And um, he, he stated something that, you know, he, he, because he helps now people with disabilities to find work in the St. John's and St. region. He understands because he understands disability. And of course, um, he, he, he also wants to help other people to find jobs to, you know, enable them to go out, be more, um, you know, active in their communities. For that persons with disabilities, participate in different, you know, programs that can improve their, you know, improve their work and life balance. So he, you know, he stated that um, employers, as he has found out, they actually want, they, they are not reluctant to hire persons with disabilities. Most of them, the same way they want to hire new Canadians and seniors, of course, because it's very important for them to be inclusive of people with uh, persons with disabilities and all the other groups. But they are so afraid of doing the wrong thing. Most employers, you know, they, they are not properly educated on how to hire persons, they are afraid of offending them. You know, how they are so afraid to do the wrong thing, they can't do the right thing, he said, that, you know, they are afraid of, you know, offending someone with a disability, maybe using a language they shouldn't use. They do not understand 
how to properly communicate with them. And I also, of course, I said that communication is key. And I also believe, you know, policies now should include how communication can be made easier in the, you know, employment in, in offices and organizations. Regarding, you know, disabilities, you know, it's not, disability is not an inability. If you're properly accommodated, of course, persons with disabilities will be very productive in their different, you know, positions. So mm -hmm. he, he, went, he went further to state that employers, as he has found out, because he relates with different employers by connecting persons with disabilities to fields that are suitable for them. So he said they are unfamiliar. They are not used to someone maybe who, is, who, who has a disability, how to relate to them, how they don't want to offend them. Or if somebody does not know someone from another community, maybe whether it's a disability community, immigrant community, or maybe women, you know, there, there's a kind of fear. You don't know how to relate to them first, except you get used to them. And then he said, you know, so they don't understand, not that they are unwilling. And persons with disabilities, you know, he stated, they have a lot of personality and social challenges. And the issue and challenges they struggle with is that in order to grow above an individual, they have to have other impacts in their lives. So that so they encourage them he encourages them also to work to volunteer you know be more involved in their communities build their confidence to take ownership uh, but he stated that the, the bottom line is what he has found out is and most employers are terrified you know they do not know how to relate with them so that it does not affect their business their maybe social media accounts for example he said if someone says something that is not right to a person that has a disability maybe unconsciously now, all of a sudden, it gets shared on social media, and about 5,000 people view it already. And you know it, that can affect an employer's business if it occurs. So he said, employers really want to employ, but they are not sure of how to go about it. So policies have to include how employers can be better educated, you know, on how to better accommodate persons with disabilities so they can be more productive in the workforce. And um, a lot of orientation, of course, is, is needed. Another participant, you know, um, she she said, um, you know, she has um, okay, the one that had a strain in the arm. I already spoke about, and um, she said people have to be open to speak to employers. You know, persons with disabilities, you have to be comfortable speaking to your employer. You need this accommodation. You need this, you know, economics. You need your workstation properly set up because she even said she requested a mouse a mouse pad, a different workstation that was not even given to her. And it's affected her productivity on the job, you know. And um, so as a result, I inferred that this only means that there would be, you know, a lot of persons with disabilities with different, of course, varying degrees of disabilities, mostly invisible. You know, if you don't disclose your disability or if you're not properly accommodated. So a lot of persons with disability would continue to work in an environment where their conditions are not properly or duly accommodated, either because they fear disclosure or they, to disclose their disability because they perceive there will be a stigma, people will discriminate against them, or even the employers would not be you know, pro uh, properly accommodative of you know, their conditions. And of course, we have the workplace attitudes, because from my, you know, from findings from the study, I inquired from almost all the participants, they said they see a lot of negative attitudes, even with coworkers you know, based on productivity, how to get a job done. If you're taking too long to complete a task, you start seeing the attitude towards them. So all that, you know, needs to be more addressed. So I would say a lot of persons with disabilities would continue to work in an environment where their conditions are not duly accommodated. And also, you know, they feel that because they, they might lose their jobs, there is that fear, and they feel like, oh, it will be difficult to get another job. So it's either they do not disclose or they continue to stay on the same job. And additionally, a lot of applic applicants, you know, with a disability who are seeking gainful employment or who are seeking to advance their career have at one point or the other disclosed their disabilities. So from the um, interview, from the, you know, interviews I conducted, either some of them have, of course, not gotten a job offer or they have not even gotten the, up to the interview stage. And this is plain sad, of course, and it plainly points out that persons with disabilities, you know, of course, still today, it's, it's getting better, but they are still being discriminated up till today, you know, and uh, in the workforce. 
which should not be the case as they come with their various diverse skills. And of course, persons with disabilities, they, con they contribute also positively to the labor market if properly accommodated. Employers also, ultimately the outcome of this perceived discrimination on persons with disabilities is that most of their conditions are not addressed. Employers also facilitate this by poor communication with you know, people, not all, but most employers, through you know, discriminate-free recruitment and selection practices, workplace attitudes, and of course this affects everyone in the long run. Okay, so um, I will go into my recommendations, and I know we're going to address questions later if anyone has questions. Okay, so I'll go straight into my recommendations. And um, so I have, first of all, you know, recommendations for business owners. So recommendations for employers. You know, employers have to invite fair and just hiring practices, of course. You know, which is not um, discriminatory against persons with disabilities. And um, because one thing employers, um, they have to understand is if they provide adequate accommodation support for persons with disabilities on the job, it would enhance their productivity and of course reduce the turnover rate. So this can also be cost saving for their business because it reduces the turnover rate you know, for, for the organization. And there's the issue of corporate social responsibility Employers have to go beyond maybe any legal obligations. They have to, you know, be look into the, the humanitarian aspect of employing persons with disabilities. And this would also go a long way in, you know, um, bringing a positive light to their business. So, so people will view their company in a positive light. They shouldn't look at making profit, but how they can be more inclusive you know, into the, to make persons with disabilities included in the workforce. And um, so, because of course everyone knows that, um, you know, the aim of, business, of a business in a community is to be profitable and be a major source of economic growth in a socially responsible way. But, you know, an important way to do this is to, you know, carry out a business in a socially responsible way, which is that businesses should engage, like I said, in fair and just hiring practices and look beyond all legal obligations and make their you know workplace more inclusive especially for people with disabilities and um of course the role of um i will also say for employers they have to select people you know persons with disabilities and put them in everybody even if you have a very severe disability you can if properly accommodated and provided with enough support it could be the price ergonomics, the workstation. Even they can go the extra length to, you know, have some employee, employee wellness programs in the company. They, they can be very productive. Everyone is suited for a particular position. So it doesn't matter if you have a disability. It's the same as not having a disability. If someone is properly accommodated and with the right workplace attitude, people will do well on the job. So and um, so, it's, they have to select persons with disabilities and place them, of course, in positions, accommodate them properly, where they can be productive and contribute positively to the business. And you know, um, business networks also that promote um, business development for various companies, such as um, so. Cost, okay, talking about customized accommodations for more severe disabilities. So you know, if you set up the right ergonomics, it can help. Also, employers can also look into, at least or employers can look into developing, like I said, work sites wellness programs and emulate best practices from other companies. Maybe similar companies, what they have done differently and people have recommended them positively and that they are very inclusive in the workforce. They can emulate those kind of things and it's world for sure, go in the long run, it would be beneficial to everyone, the company and everyone at large. And um, for the government, the government can, uh, you know, imp introduce new provincial regula uh, regulations and accommodations, provincial, federal. They have a very vital role to play. The government, you know, we know they provide a lot of support, but still a lot, it's not sufficient. Most of some people I interviewed, you know, like the man who runs the Disability Resource Center or even some persons with disabilities who because they said, you know, those employment um, resource centers, they were very helpful in helping them find work. But what they have found out is, even though they offer various workshops for skill development for 
persons with disabilities, they lack funding. You know, there's still a lot of areas they want to work on to help, you know, foster the recruit, recruitment and retention of persons with dis disabilities and how they can succeed in their various fields, but um, funding is a major challenge. So governments have to, you know, play this vital role to pro provide funds to businesses, to improve access to employment and social supports, and um, also, you know, enforcement of different federal laws on employers, on accommodations, and um, you know this kind of um, leg this kind of legislations can be enacted in reference to maybe re response to different barriers people report to them, you know, and the barriers persons with disabilities still face today while being trying to get integrated into the labor market. So the provincial government, even the federal government, they can draft various regulations requiring businesses to different organizations, right, be it um, private to disclose the percentage of persons with disabilities they employ annually. And of course, this can be used, you know, and also maybe who disclose their status while trying to find work. And also require, government should also, you know, provide new reg um, legislation that would require employers to keep records on the number of persons with disabilities, you know, the, that apply for work, that apply to the organization annually for work. And, you know, when there is a significant difference in this, you know, numbers of persons with disabilities hired from other businesses, the provincial, um, provincial governments can mandate that firms who hire less persons with disabilities give a rationale for why they're not currently hiring more, why they're not, you know, in being more inclusive of persons with disabilities. And this can go a long way, you know, if the competition is there and they see that, okay, this company is getting more grants from the government based on how inclusive they are. Of course, I know other um, employers who are not up to task in accommodating more persons with disabilities would buckle up, of course, to, you know, recruit more persons with disabilities. Also, tax breaks. The government can offer tax breaks or government grants. Of course, you know, this is very important to enable various businesses to provide sufficient accommodation or facilities to hire persons with disabilities. This will create more financial security for different businesses, econ economic incentives for businesses to hire more persons with disabilities, which is very important as persons with disabilities bring diverse skills, you know, into the workforce as well. And the government can also, you know, enforce different training programs for employers because, you know, of course, findings from the study indicated that even though employers want to, want to hire persons with disabilities, they are unsure of how to go about it. Most of them are not properly educated on how to go about it, you know, and they just don't want to offend people. They don't want to offend persons with disabilities because they know it will be bad for their business. And so the government, you know, and um, they can, um, you know, they can identify positions as well, as well where there's underemployment, you know, that persons with disabilities can, uh, you know, can definitely feel, be qualified to feel, develop dif different training programs, which could be implemented at colleges, even universities, implemented into the university curriculum on accommodation to educate employers, even employees, everyone in general, to be, you know, more inclusive of persons with disabilities. And um, this would go a long way to, you know, better inform everyone on how to properly accommodate persons with disabilities while finding work during employment or even trying to advance their career. And um, for persons with disabilities, um, you know, because findings from this study has also revealed, okay, and then more recommendations for the government, you know, I've talked about they can enforce various mandatory training programs for employers to be taken by, of course, all employers and employees of the organization. And um, because I gathered from my study, of course, that disability resource centers within the St. John's region and the suburbs, they are really doing a great job. Like all the, you know, interviewees, the participants of this study, they said they got great help in terms of skills development, finding work through these employment agencies. But um, still on the job, they see the workplace attitude towards them, even regarding their, you know, work hours, Sometimes some of them get less work hours than the others. And it's either maybe when the business is slow, one particular participant said they tell him to leave early, as opposed to other people without a disability. He has, has a physical disability. And those kind of things they see. So employers, even fellow employees, need more sensitization 
on you know areas like this discrimination against persons with disabilities and also and um because the training programs i mentioned can also prepare persons with disabilities you know to um um be more productive in the, what um different positions they get in different organizations and the outcome of this is that um persons with disabilities if they are given more opportunities for gainful employment you know, businesses can fill even different positions that are not that are short staffed if they are properly accommodated. And lastly, for the government, government of course they should continually sponsor different research on accommodations, persons with disabilities and accommodations, workplace experiences, how they can be better accommodated and integrated into the labor force. And for persons with disabilities, because findings from the study reveal that most, you know, um, most persons with disabilities, they have the impression, you know, of it's very challenging for them when applying for jobs to disclose. They are either unsure or, you know, how if they want to disclose their disability when applying. But I recall a particular participant telling me he doesn't disclose when applying, but when he gets the interview, he discloses just to let the employer know he would need this accommodation or, and, and um, because he, of course, has an invisible disability. Well, you know, it's more difficult for persons with a physical disability, you know, because when they, like the lady, you know, who had a physical, she was in a wheelchair, and she said the building was not even accessible. And she had gotten to the interview, and they kept her in the waiting room, and she had them discussing something different about a Christmas party. So she saw, you know, she saw the attitude already. She felt it. And when they eventually started the interview, um, she saw, of course, the awkwardness. So and which is very unfortunate, and um, so for PWDs, I would say that they should feel more confident to you know disclose their disability because that's not inability to do a job. They should just you know they can make the employers know they would need this accommodations. It should be based on their skill sets, their intellect, their resume, what they bring to the table, because that's how it should be. And um, however, because if they maybe do not disclose, even if they get a job for persons with invisible disabilities, it might have a negative impact on their productivity on the job as well. And um, as we all know, um, so like different stakeholders, like the government, employers, you know, pe persons with disabilities, they have a role to play in their respective, you know, roles in making the workplace more productive. And the um, employers have a big role to play in making the workplace more accessible. So persons with, dis um, persons with disabilities, um, their recommendations for them is they should, you know, continue to be encouraged, of course, to seek work in their fields or work they, they want to apply for, are capable of doing, and feel more confident to disclose their disabilities so that employers and other appropriate departments can make informed decisions you know, during the employment process and how to accommodate them, provide them support facilities to make them very productive, you know, in the, in the workforce. And because we know, of course, this role, the disclosure could, is, could be a challenging one for them. And uh, as most of the participants identified from the study, they would rather not disclose their status, you know, while applying for jobs for fear of being discriminated against. But, um, you know, like I said, this could also, if they don't disclose, it could create some Virus for for them as well, but but like the um, lady with a physical disability, she stated that she will disclose her disability. Whether she's applying for jobs, she will disclose her disability, not because she has a physical disability, but because she feels she you know when she discloses, of course, there are a lot of um, things she has had to apply for online. She's entitled to certain benefits from the government when she discloses her disability status, and. Um, so, and um, that, that should be key to every person with disability. They know, of course, that when they disclose, the right thing is for employers, you know, to accommodate them properly on the job. And um, I would also say persons with um, disabilities should continue participating, you know, in various research relating to disability and accommodations to keep sharing their experiences and um, so that researchers can make, you know, useful recommendations and propose, you know, different policy solutions that can foster their recruitment and retention into the labor force, of course, and make them you know, more productive and comfortable in the labor, labor force. And that would go a long way in also enhancing their productivity, improving their work and life balance, and of course, everyone will be happy. And for future research, 
future research should look into, you know, the economic and opportunity cost for businesses and um, on accommodation. And um, because, of course, um, there are several directions that future research can take on this topic. And on the perspective of economic cost for a business, like corporate social responsibility as well, even legal and political requirements, like I stated, by employers. You know, the um, for opportunity cost, a business can look at, you know, um, what they can do better. Like opportunity cost can be an alternative for them to enjoy the order, which means that they should look at the the long run, the the effect, the positive effect on the long run, if they bring in a lot of persons with disabilities into the organization. They come with diverse skills. This is product this is good for the you know organization. If they are properly accommodated, of course everyone will be productive on their job. It's even normal for a person without disability. If you have a workstation you're not comfortable with working on, it's gonna affect the way you work one way or the other. So um you know um, they should look at this that if persons with disabilities are properly accommodated, forget about maybe you, you, it's very expensive for you to provide this accommodation, but look at it in the long run. It will reduce the turnover rate for the company because if a person with disability is not properly accommodated, is it that they quit or like one the participant that said she was actually fired on the job? So, and of course, you know, different legal and political requirements as well on hiring practices. Should, future research should also look into that. Like I said, the government can mandate a lot of employers, you know, to go through um, different training programs on fair and just hiring practices. And also the healthcare sector for PWDs, um, it's, it needs for, for the research because a number of participants mentioned that um, even though they have work, most of their medication they use is not covered. And that's expensive for them to foot their healthcare bills as well even after they employ, um, obtain employment. This is um, usually like a financial burden to them. And most persons with disabilities, they require adequate health care for their disabilities in order to you know, avoid any secondary conditions that can arise as a result of their disabilities. Even depression and other things can occur if you know, they are not properly catered for health-wise. That could affect them and bring in even secondary conditions which could be, that wouldn't be good. And most persons with disabilities, you know, even when employed, they have some health insurance from their place of work, but not everything is covered. And um, so like, according to the Healthy People 2010 plan, persons with certain disabilities, they are generally less physically active, that's what the plan says, you know, than persons with, without disabilities. And they said they are prone to higher risk of depression, even obesity, and other secondary conditions that could occur in addition to their primary disability if they are not properly catered for health, health-wise. Hence, it's very um, imperative that organizations, you know, go take into proper considerations employees with disabilities. They should, you know, when designing health benefits plan, because such programs will definitely go a long way in improving their general health and well-being. And they should go a step further, because two, like two participants mentioned, they're actually not covered for their expensive medications. And, um, and this can also help to mitigate, mitigate against the secondary conditions that can arise, of course, as a result of their primary disabilities, and which would make them more productive, reduce the you know, absenteeism, healthcare cost for them, financial, psychological stress, subsequently generating greater returns for the company as well by reducing the turnover rate. So insurance, the insurance healthcare sector for persons with disabilities can be you know, further researched, how it can be improved. And of course, evidence-based hiring practices as well, like I said, which could be like best practices, what's a company that has been successful and maybe that has been identified even globally in how they have successfully, you know, um, hired a lot of persons with disabilities, how inclusive they have been, and how successful they have been in, in recruiting persons with disabilities, how it has even been of great, um, you know, um, positive results to their own company, how it has generated returns for their company. And people can, for that they can look at these, you know, areas, evidence-based hiring practices, and other employers should invite these practices to improve their own, you know, hiring practices for persons with disabilities. 
that should also go a long way. Because, you know, when a person with disability cannot find work, there is a greater dependency, of course, uh, for maybe family, you know, for resources of the government. And um, so I, there's still, I think, a lack of research focused on understanding the impacts that not employing enough persons with disabilities can have on maybe family, public resources, how their unemployment impacts also, you know, the global economy at large. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So, and I say, I, and also I would say more economic research should approach these issues to understand the impacts that unemployment of persons with, on the employment and on unemployment, of course, of persons with disabilities on the local, provincial, and national level, uh, the impact it would have also on, you know, government resources in the long run. And um, findings from this research would definitely be evidence enough to help contribute to a greater understanding of economic costs, implications, and of course, discriminations against persons with disabilities. So also, you know, I've mentioned corporate social responsibility. So it's a concept related, like, like I said, to ethical behavior of business managers, looking beyond maybe any legal obligations to actively, you know, pursue things, um, humanitarian, you know, um, hiring roles to encourage persons with disabilities to be more inclusive in the workforce. And um, of course, future research can also explore legal and regulatory elements of various leg legislation associated with persons with disabilities because there are still a lot of federal laws in place which are designed to protect persons with, their, with disabilities, but they are still, it's still recorded, persons with disabilities are still facing discrimination, even according to current study. So examining how it is that these laws, you know, have led to successful legal action against violators as employers could be useful in understanding areas where the laws have been effective and how they can be improved to help other businesses be more inclusive in the workforce. Thank you. <laughs> My time is up. <laughs> Thank you very much, Olumade. You're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah, I think everyone uh, really appreciates the level of depth and insight that you shared with your participants' experiences. You're welcome. Um, not all of us I have... try to be as brief as possible, but I know they can ask questions. Yeah, yes. yeah. So, we, we have some questions for you. Okay. Um, and just in case for people in the audience, okay. uh, we've got about eight minutes left. If you do have questions, okay. feel free to put those in the Q&A box or in the chat. Um, we have a couple from Kimberly, okay. uh, so I'll share those with you. Thanks. Uh, the first thing uh, Kimberly stated is thank you. Uh, you use the word accommodations yes. throughout your presentation. Yes. We are finding that using the word accommodations can contribute mm -hmm. to the stigma that okay. as others without disabilities see people with disabilities given Privilege. privileges as accommodating can infer. Okay. So there's uh, Kimberly stating that we prefer the term workplace okay. adjustments. I'm okay. wondering what you think of that. Not accommodations, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Because I know, you know, the accommodations is kind of the word I see most people use. Well, workplace adjustments sound very good too because it could be related to, like I mentioned, ergonomics, how a workstation you know, can be properly set for a person with disability regarding that kind of ergonomics. So workplace adjustments sounds good too, but accommodations is a word that I would say could be um, how some an employer can also be more receptive. But, you know, I really don't... You know, because that's what I know most people use. But I've also, of course, had workplace adjustments, and I know, of course, it's relating to you know accommodation. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so perhaps it depends on the situation. On the situation, yes, it will depend on the situation because she said um, it could contribute to the stigma mm -hmm. that others without see people. I understand. So workplace adjustments would be a better word to use. Mm -hmm. Okay. For sure. And then we had huh. another comment <laughs> from Kimberly. Okay. Um, uh, when you were talking, uh, I believe, about employers mm -hmm. and recommendations for employers, Kimberly okay. stated um, that she prefers incentives for employers okay. Okay. instead of enforcement of training, but that she totally agrees okay. with you. Um, and her question is, do you have any ideas of what some of those incentives might be for employers? Okay, so because by his incentives, I would say government grants, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's different from like the training program. So uh, I said, um, I use the word enforcement because like the man who runs the disability resource center said a lot of employers actually, they want to employ persons with disabilities. That's, which is a normal thing to do, but they are scared of how to go about it. They, are, they don't understand 
how to properly accommodate them, right? But they need education because there's still a lot of education, of course, constant education and education needs to be done to let them know this is how you can go about it. But, you know, if, if enforcement might be a strong word, but I think if the government kind of, you know, sanctions that, a lot of employers would have to go through that, and they know that this is the, what they have to do to, you know, make persons with disabilities more in integrated, you know, into the workforce because they are obligated to do that. You understand? And in terms of, you know, incentives, like I said, um, they could offer tax breaks, to, you know, to companies, grants on, you know, maybe how a company can even invite different worksite wellness programs to help, you know, persons with disabilities be more productive on the workforce. So that's different, like government grants. So maybe, like, like I said, tax breaks would go a long way as well. Yeah, which makes sense, the idea that yeah. incentives and enforcement together can be used, it, yeah. depending so, on the economy. Yeah, if they are enforced and then they are provided with the right financial incentives, and then everything will work well because they have the funds, right, to hire persons with disabilities, provide no matter how expensive, Accommodation. It could be a hearing aid or something, you know, or you know, some a screen reader. Something a person with disability needs to be to work because even if it's a visually impaired person, that person can do the job if you're provided with a non-screen screen reader for whatever position you are, you know, suitable to work in. You can perform well on the job. You understand? Great. Yeah. And so okay. we have a few more minutes left, uh, and then okay. we'll wrap up. Um, I'll end with one final question, okay. um, which is that we usually don't, um, we don't always have research on yes. the experiences of persons with disabilities in Newfoundland. Often in Canada, yes. we're looking at other contexts. Yes. Um, but of course, this is a very important context to study mm -hmm. in, in St. John. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm curious if, in your experience there, mm -hmm. the your work experience and employment experience of your participants might be different because of context. Yes, context, yes. A geographic context. Yeah, geographic context, exactly. So I would say, you know, because in Newfoundland, you know, even they recorded like the highest unemployment rate in, that would be 2017 in Newfoundland, for the whole of Canada, Newfoundland and Labrador. Yeah, I have it somewhere in my report. It's they, you know, recorded the lowest unemployment rate. I would say because it's kind of number one, it's a smaller province compared to, as opposed to, you know, Ontario is big. And, of course, the geographic context. Most of these suburban areas, they are a bit, um, I would say, not isolated, but it's, it, it's only St. John's you will see is very commercial. And most of the social supports that persons with disabilities get, people from the outskirts, they all come into St. John's, which is the capital city, for, you know, to access social support, health care, to come to the hospitals, even to, for schooling, they come to St. John's. And like even two, I interviewed two high school students. And you know, right after high school, they, they said, of course, while they were in school, they didn't get any support, any accommodations. In, they lived in the suburbs. But after high school, they moved to the city to get a job. And both of them got a job in some you know, big household store. And um, well, they are trying to say that if they had maybe gone further to college, they might be able to get even a more skilled job. That was what one of them mentioned. He might have been able to get a job more skilled in his profession. So yeah, I would say you know employment for they they are a bit at, at a disadvantage because already there so there are limited job opportunities. Even for people with most people when they finish in the university, you see them leaving. We come here to Ontario for job opportunities. So now imagine people, even persons with disabilities, they feel it will even be a more disadvantage to them. And that is why, you know, a lot of them even stated they find it, they, they're reluctant to disclose because, of course, they know there are already limited job opportunities available, and that might be a barrier to them to even obtain employment. Yes. Thank you. So You're welcome. We are at the end of our hour. Um, clearly, the participants enjoyed the talk because we have our final questions are about your contact information and how they can get a copy of your report. Sure. Um, so if, if it's I okay with give, you, yes, for yeah, sure. We'll we'll share that information probably with a follow-up email. Okay. Uh, to attendees after okay. the talk. Okay. I would love to send that <laughs> to everyone. Anyone that wants the copy. Thank you very much. You're Gloria. welcome. Uh, it was a great presentation. Thank uh, you. Okay. Thank you so much. And of course, I would love to share a copy of my report. 
to anyone that you know wants it. And I know we we're gonna send a copy also because my our community partner for my research was Empower, the Disability Resource Center in St. John's, Newfoundland. So they were very proactive also in helping me get some participants who were willing to share their experiences. And um, I'll also be submitting a copy to them. And of course, to CRWDP also. Fantastic. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for having me.